Hello, everybody, and welcome to One Day Today. We are on episode 51. As you saw last week, we had our board of directors share. We had a special week. Just we wanted to give you a, just a taste of all the people that are behind this movement and all the incredible, extraordinary hearts and minds who are supporting us and bringing this vision, our one day vision to fruition. But now we're back to, to scheduling as normal. We have a, I'm really excited about our guest today. Um, it's, it's, been a be- it's been a beautiful, transformative week for me. I've had a lot of obstacles, a lot of realizations. And it's funny, every time that I feel stopped, every time I, you know, the things that I have planned, the things I want to do, the things I, I'm trying to get it all done. I want to do everything and, and then some. And every time I hit a block, I hit a wall, at first, you know, I want to like kick and scream and say, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But then I always remember, well, I don't always, but then I stand to remember that every obstacle is there to teach me something. Every, everything that's in my way is there to teach me a lesson, but also to give me an opportunity to grow and to, to gain to gain something that, that wasn't there before. Get something, some wisdom, something that was in my way is actually an opportunity. You know, what, what, what seems like a speed bump could actually be a ramp that launches me over the moon. And when I stand there, everything's in its right place. Everything is exactly where it needs to be. And it's, it's just, you know, waking up with the, the courage to face the things that are scary every day, the things that I don't want to do, the things that are in my way, the things that I want to avoid or distract myself from. But this is a, this is a beautiful space for me to share myself, but also for all our wonderful guests that we've had and guests to come to just share the gift that they are. And that's why we have this stage. So let me say hello and check in with our co-host, Matthew. Matthew, how are you doing today, brother? Once I make, I make my life, there we go. Um, <laughs> man, I'm feeling you on the difficult week. Actually, the last two weeks, it's been like I kind of, I kind of suspect that all the angers that I have not let myself feel when I like look at the destruction that is being created on this planet right now and the suffering and and all that, like all that anger is like is bubbling up and. Um, it's just been a week of general fuck yous. Like, just... I, uh, man. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. Like, uh, I, I'm here. I'm, I'm present. But I am pretty... I'm still pretty angry at everything right now. Just in general. So there is that. Um, and, yeah, it is spaces like this where we can come and be vulnerable that I find refreshing just to be able to come and say without fear of being judged I've been really angry I am incre- I am incredibly angry mm. um, is a relief it really is and I kind of just thank you for sticking with this and sticking with me and like keeping keep pushing me to come back on here even on, even on the weeks when I don't really want to <laughs> I do appreciate it <laughs> absolutely well and I appreciate you sharing you know like as like anger you know I've a lot of my life I've suppressed anger all the anger I've tried to all the anger I felt I would suppress and put inward and not really be honest with myself that I have resentment, that I have anger. So I'm just like stewing on it. I'm just holding it. And what was it? There's a, I think a friend of mine said about speaking about resentment saying resentment is, is this is the best, most apt um, definition of resentment. That is me drinking the poison and waiting for somebody else to die, waiting for someone else to suffer. And it's like, and while there is resentment um, that I've held on to and things that I've, you know, th- things that I have not expressed my own, you know, my own self, but there, there's also righteous anger. There are times in the world, especially in like in the world with all the things happening, sometimes anger is a time, it, there, sometimes anger is an emotion that needs to be expressed because there's no other way it has to be let out. Like in the, in the animal kingdom, like 
you know, when, when ducks or swans will get in an argument or a dispute in a pond, they'll, they'll flap their wings like, like violently to like, to let that out because we can't, if we just repress it and we hold it in, it becomes more toxic. We, we does more damage. I think it's powerful. Yeah. For me, it's just a, it's a question of whether that letting go or releasing or acting on the anger is conscious or unconscious. Mm. Like, is mm-hmm. it, is it just blind lashing out of rage? And mm-hmm. if so, are you aware of the suffering that you're creating by doing that? Or is it this? Yeah, I'm angry. Yeah. This feels wholly appropriate. And the actually, it actually feels necessary in this moment to say it, but to say it from the heart, not from like, I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain. Cause it's, I had this moment with my parents not a while back, actually about a week ago, a week and a half ago where like we got into it and there's just this overwhelming urge to tell them to fuck off. And I I stopped. I was like, before I even said it, I was like, does like, I checked in. I was like, is this appropriate to say it? Like, is this actually appropriate to to let, to let out right now? And it was an overwhelming. Yes. Like just for whatever reason, I don't, I don't know the reasons, but, um, so I said it and what it led to was unexpected. Um, like, and that's, that's the thing. Like using anger consciously often leads to construction. Like it often leads to actually building relationships. In my experience, it leads to um, revealing truths that haven't been said forever and ever and ever. It reveals, it, it reveals like, the true essence of where each person is at, but like mm. lashing out unconsciously, just like blind rage. It's very, destru- it's very destructive in my experience. It just hurts people and pushes people away and creates invisible walls and boundaries that don't really need to be there. Right. It, it stews and it creates more toxicity than it, than it does release and build construct con- constructive, creative, creative energy on top of it. Yeah. And like, I, I, I feel like that can be true of any emotion. Like there's no such thing as a good or a bad emotion. It's, it's how that emotion is mm. put out into the world, I guess is, is a decent way of saying it. Like it, it's, is that emotion conscious? Like, are you aware you're actually doing these things and you're doing them from a fully conscious place or is it unconsciously? Like, do you even know what you're saying right now or why you're angry or what you're angry about? Right. Or sad yeah. about, or like, yeah. Yeah, they all have a potential to be destructive, but also to be creative. And we can yeah. fill in the space of a negative, a negative emotion to actually create something beautiful, despite that negative emotion, that that feeling of toxicity. Um, exactly. Yeah, I'm gonna let's bring in let's bring in Michael. We have our first guest here, Michael, Michael Bridgman. Michael, Oops, there you are. Thank you for joining us, Michael. How are you doing? Gentlemen. Today? I'm fabulous. How are you guys? Doing well. Doing well. I'm so happy to have you. It's, Matthew's uh, angry. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're well and we're angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a that was an interesting start to this whole thing. So I'm 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 sitting back there and I'm listening. And I'm like, whoa. I, it's just kind of changing the topic of what I'm going to talk about. I think <laughs> I'm live editing. I'm live editing. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Well, we we appreciate you being here. I'm just going to let you have at it. But Michael, if you're ready. If it sounds good to you, the stage is yours. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And guys, I may at any given time, I don't know, I, I might wind up going, what do you guys think of this or something like that? So if it's if there's a section of this that becomes sort of conversationable, I'm totally open to that. But uh, what Matthew was saying there is is fascinating because – I think it speaks to the idea of are you reacting or are you responding, right? And when you're, when we're in situations constantly over time, we, uh, we tend to get into reactionary modes. So there's just these knee jerk reactions and then we're, we're instinctively acting on something rather than taking that moment uh, as perhaps Matthew did there and going, should I say this to my parents or should I not say this to my parents? And then responding in kind to what his instincts are talking about, because 
that's a part of what becoming a, a higher thought being our best version of ourselves is all about, right, gentlemen, or anybody else who's watching this today or in the replay. It's about actually self-evolving and actually taking taking ownership, taking responsibility, taking taking credit for crying out loud when it when it goes right or when it doesn't for what we're actually doing and who we are and how we're behaving. So I, I, I'm going to riff on that topic for a little bit today. But before I dive super deep into that and kind of give some insight into how I've been able to tweak some of my stuff and my behaviors and move from like a purely reactive sort of reactionary knee-jerk reactive state, which I think a lot of people live in. Like, let's be honest, the road rage stuff, the, 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 the people just reacting to the news, people getting super frustrated on a steady basis. They're in reactionary mode, right? They're not responding. They're not going, how does this affect me? Do I want to respond this way? And taking that moment, they're just, they're just lashing. They're just as, as Matthew put it, they're just on you know, unabridged rage is not good for anybody. Um, but they're just in reactionary mode. And I think a lot of people get stuck there and I'm going to get into why I think that happens uh, from all the studying that I've done. But before I do uh, just a quick introduction, Abram, thanks for introducing me, my friend. Uh, my name is Michael Bridgman. Anybody who's watching this, I'm a speaker, an author, and the CEO of multiple companies. I'm a proud Vancouver. There we go. There we go. There we go. Can I get that? There we go. Vancouver, right? Canadian. And, uh, and I'm super thrilled to be here. I have been on not, I wouldn't call this an epic entrepreneurial journey yet. I am on one, but I have not reached the pinnacle by any stretch of what I want to accomplish in life. And I imagine if you're watching this, then you feel the exact same way. But I've been through some ups and downs, and I'll bet you have too. You've been through some trials and some tribulations, and perhaps at times you've had those reactionary rather than responsive respondings, Right? Responses? Responses. <laughs> You've had those reactionary responses instead of taking the time to respond responses. And oh, is everything okay, guys? Oh, they pop back in. Okay, they're gonna get. And uh, and if you think back on those times, they're they're times of huge learning, aren't they? Right? Because I, if you're watching this right now, then you're probably in the belief the same as Matthew and the same as Abram and I are, and that. You only have today. You only have now. The past is gone, right? Those reactionary decisions that you fell into, those challenges that you faced, and I faced some doozies. And frankly, I made some poor decisions in my life. I have made some very poor decisions in my life, and they have caused some damage. They've caused some relationships to be torn apart. They've they've hurt companies that I was that I owned or was working in. They, you know, I made one decision, you guys, back in my life that essentially tore down a career for me, a very promising one. <clears throat> and, but I, I, I'm not, we can't be victims of those decisions, right? Like we have to use today to move forward. You can be a fraction of a percent better today than you were yesterday. You can be a fraction of percent better tomorrow than you were today. We can incrementally, we can in iteration become our absolute best selves. And that speaks to the idea that that I love this this profound belief inside me. And maybe this resonates with you, maybe it doesn't. But and and some of the stuff you probably have heard already. Like some of the things that I'm going to say today, they might not be new news to you. If you're on this train, if you're listening to these two phenomenal gentlemen, if you're, if you're watching any sort of personal evolutionary or personal development material, then chances are some of these ideas are not new for you. But as the great Sir Isaac Newton said, if I achieve anything in life, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's what we have the privilege of doing, right? We get to stand on the shoulders of the greatest people that have come before us and leap from there into our best selves. And so with that in mind, perhaps what I say today is touches your ear. A little bit differently than it has before. Perhaps the words I use are just a little bit different. Perhaps the version of you that shows up today and the version of me that shows up today is just different enough that this really lands for you and works for you because you only have today. You only have right now and now is the time. I mean, look at the world around us. Now is the time, right? 
amidst chaos, greatness is created amidst all this, this not stuff that happens. I mean, I'm up in Canada, so I'm a little bit sheltered from some of it, but man, oh man, there's some wild and wacky stuff going on out there. And I'll tell you, amidst those things, great people like Matthew and Abram find their voice. They find their power. They find their persistent privilege to pursue what it is that they want to pursue. They find those things and they find that purpose. And I think it's really important for us to remember this one single belief that you and I are both the sculptor and the clay in our lives. That we're both the sculptor and the clay. That means that that we are molding ourselves as we grow. We're molding ourselves, our decisions, those, as, as Matthew was putting it, the idea of reacting versus responding, that idea that our responses or our reactions evolve what it is that we're crafting here. They evolve this thing. And Matthew was talking about anger and how it comes up. And, and you don't want to deny it, right? As Abram mentioned, you don't want to deny anger. Right? You don't want to deny your feelings because then they get trapped, they get stuck. And that has a whole host of other genetic problems that we're that we don't have no time nor space to dive into. But when you trap feelings inside your body, they tend to be rather destructive while they're hanging around in there. They bang around, they get worse, they fester, and they become very dangerous that way. So you have to let it out. But it's about letting it out in a way that makes sense. It's about letting it out in a way that is controlled and has the intention that you want. And, and we have to remember that, that that is sculpting us like that. Those responses that we're having, they're dictating who we are and what we become. And I'll take you back to that, that moment where I basically made some decisions in my life that kind of ruined my career. So I was sitting in the office of my first year acting teacher. Her name was Sandy Nichols. And Sandy was, she was one of those beautiful people guys that she was a gorgeous person, gorgeous inside, gorgeous out. She had these phenomenal blue eyes um, and just a wonderful, wonderful soul. One of these people that you would just, you would do anything for. She's a beautiful person. And <clears throat> I was sitting in her office and I had the luxury and the privilege and the talent to get into one of the most prestigious acting schools in Canada. <laughs> yes, gentlemen, Canada does have a prestigious acting school. Just, just to let you know, we have a couple. Anyway, one of them is in Edmonton of all places. It's in Edmonton, but it makes sense because Edmonton has a very rich theater community because nine months out of the year, it's snowing there. Edmonton has two seasons. They have construction and winter. That's it, right? And so what else are these people going to do for seven, eight, nine months of the year, but go to shows. So they have a very rich theater community there and one of the best acting schools in the country. They audition normally about 400 every year and they only accept 12. So it was a very challenging program to get in, even more challenging to stick with. And I was doing very well. And at the end of my first year, Sandy said something to me that affected me forever from that point forward. That was... 17 years ago, guys, 17 years ago. And she said this thing to me and it has affected my life ever since. And for a long time, I was haunted by it. I was haunted by my reaction to what she said. And it wasn't the reaction in that moment. It was the reaction that I had over and over again afterwards. It was, it was what she had said to me and then how I used it over and over again afterwards. Because I don't think that we do one grand gesture and that's who we are, right, guys? I mean, that's just not the way things work. We reinforce who we are by the habits that we take, the actions that we take repeated over and over and over again. You are not the product of your circumstances. You are the product of your habits, says the great Stephen Covey. And I did, I started practicing some habits from that point forward that destroyed my acting career. And over the course of the next two years, I did a lot of things that I look back on with a tremendous amount of regret, to be honest. I look back on those moments with a lot of just one of those things, guys, where you're like, what the hell? What the fuck were you thinking, Michael? Like, seriously, what the hell are you thinking? Right. And I, and I just, the relationships that I screwed up and, and the opportunities that I, that I just, burned down to the ground. And they, they affected me for a really long time. And 
to be honest, they still influence me today, but not in the negative way that they used to. You know, Matt, you were talking about anger, and I think that anger dictates our boundaries. Like we have rules, right? Like we have personal, uh, some people call them core values. Some people call them, um, you know, gosh, what else? I, just some sort of like your moral compass, as it were. And I think there's some there's some guidelines, there's some fence posts, right, guys, where we where we stay within these these guidelines and we're hurtling along in our life and we've got up these rules. You know, like for example, I was I was educating a new group of staff members for my company, which I'm at right now. I own a, a pet wellness center. We were just discussing off air how very Vancouver that is, a pet wellness center. And we were talking about that. And so I was training some new staff today and we went through the core values as a company. And they're essentially the way that we filter all of our decisions. You know, pets come first is our first core value as a company. So if this is not a pets come first decision, then we don't, we say no, you know what I mean? So I think that anger often reflects when we hit the edges of those boundaries or when someone else hits the edges of those boundaries upon us. And it's, and I think it flares up because we go, I'm not letting this happen again, or I've, or I am letting it happen again. And now I'm angry about it, you know, because there's a violation of who we are. There's a violation of those core values. They, 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 they tend to, to, to lash at them. And when that happens, that's when the anger thrusts up. Whatever is important to you. If you're watching this right now, you have things that are important to you, I imagine, right? And if you think about one of those things right now, if you think about one of those things that's super important to you right now, have you got it? Okay, good. If you got that thing and somebody attacks it, somebody starts tearing it down, somebody starts bad-mouthing it, somebody starts taking it even for granted or or they start to push you around on it. They're attacking one of your core beliefs and that will snap out anger. That's the flare, right? So anger is valuable in, in illustrating to us what our edges are. But for, I just had a thought, but for those of you who want some pretty profound reading, when you really want to understand what I'm, you know, even deeper on this level and Matthew, this would be really powerful for both of you guys. Read this book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And this is what I'm getting at by Sculptor and Clay. You have a choice, my friend. If you're watching this right now, you have a choice. What Viktor Frankl talks about is that he was a prisoner in the Nazi concentration camps. It's a Jewish, a, um, Jewish psychologist. And so he was a prisoner. And they made it... His, his captors made it a game to attempt to break his spirit. And they did some pretty horrifying things of which I will not share today. But he said that between all of the things they were doing, all the actions they took upon him and those he cared about, he said between what they did to him or to those he loved and and what he did there's a space there's a gap in there where we decide where we get to choose how we react in other words we stop reacting we start responding we get to choose and here's one of the quests that I think so many people that want to reach a higher level of thought, a higher level of who they are, the best, best version of themselves. Because the best version of you is not something that just shows up on a Tuesday afternoon. It has to show up repeatedly. Am I right? Olympic athletes are not Olympic athletes because they happen to get in the pool on a Wednesday and they're really good by Friday. They show up over and over and over again. If you want to be the best version of you, you got to show up today. you got to show up tomorrow. you got to show up, show up, show up, show up, show up. You got to keep showing up. And that means you got to choose to respond that way. Choose to respond that way. Victor Frankl said there was a gap between what was happening to me and those I loved and what I wanted to do with it. And in that gap, I became who I am. That is who I am. And today I choose to be that thing. You are not a product of your circumstances. In other words, all the shit that happened to you in the past, all the things that went on behind you, the bad decision that I made in my life sitting there with Sandy Nichols, it's not who I am. Does it influence me today? Absolutely it does because I don't want to go back to that person. 
but it's not who I am. I have an opportunity in that gap, in that space that Viktor Frankl talks about to choose who I want to be. In other words, be both the sculptor and the clay. Be both the sculptor and the clay. Now, we need that negative energy, though. There's a yin and yang symbol for a reason. There is a dark energy that sometimes comes. And Matthew, this is perhaps what you're referencing too. There's this dark energy. It's not positive. It's not all glowy roses and let's have fun, talk about positive things and look at everything as roses. No, sometimes in the dark, when it is dangerous, when you have to put the work in, when it's fuck you, I'm going to get this done despite what you said to me. There is an energy to that that empowers the greatest of us. You don't think Viktor Frankl thought everything was positive and roses in the middle of Dachau? No. But he did say, you will not break me. Because I choose. I'm not going to let you choose. I'm not going to let my circumstances choose for me. I get to choose. You have a choice. In other words, you are the sculptor. And it can rain upon you. The winds can beat you. The sun can burn upon you. But you will stand the test of time if you choose to. And that's that difference between simply reacting to what the world is throwing at you and responding to what the world is throwing at you. And so when Sandy Nichols looked at me, and she said, Michael, you're very good at what you do. You have a lot of talent. And you could go act professionally right now. But you need to stay here. You need to stay in school because you need to hone your craft and hone your skills because you have a responsibility to your talent. Now, after I got over the initial shock that Sandy Nichols told me that I was talented and I was good. Because <laughs> that was amazing. I had this profound mantle, almost this burden, guys, this like backpack put upon me. She said, I have a responsibility to my talent. And I thought, holy shit. And you know what's funny is those words, they gave me an ego. They gave me a level of arrogance. They gave me this attitude problem that I let permeate, seep in, like tangle the roots. And they took over the next two years of my work. And I, you know what? I, I was really good at it. So I could get by with being only, you know, so committed to the process. But the fact was, is it ruined some relationships with directors that would have loved to have hired me. It gave me an ego that I wanted to be sought after instead of a level of humility and some humbleness and where I was, and the, there was no gratitude in me. No gratitude, guys, none. It's arrogance, ego. You know, I'm, I'm a very nice person, so I wasn't an asshole, but deep down I was super competitive and I wanted what was best for me in many, many situations. And that cost me friends. I can't even, you know, a lot of people go through university and they develop some of their best friendships. I heard that all the time. Some of the best friends you'll have for your whole life you'll find in university. Guess what, guys? I have got none of those. None of them. Because I think they saw through it. I think in the end they thought, man, I don't need to be with this arrogant jackass. And although, as I said, I wasn't, nasty to anyone. I wasn't, there was a sense, I think, underneath it all of an ego. And it ruined that opportunity for me. And rather than tough it out, rather than eat some humble pie and, and stay in the industry, I just left. I just left. <clears throat> I had some offers and I turned them down and I just, I just left. Part of that reason, I think, was the journey that I'm on. And so you may have had these circumstances, you guys. You might have had these things where you're like, man, I don't love that choice. I hate the fact that I made that choice. And it was 10 years ago. It was 20 years ago. It was 40 years ago. 
doesn't matter. You might not have made that choice, but the great Canadian author, Guy Gabriel Kay, says, simply because the path you're on is not one you chose does not mean you're not supposed to be on it. Isn't that great? You're here for a reason. You're listening to this for a reason. There's something here for you, and you can choose whether to pick it up and run with it or simply drop it and ignore it. It's your choice. Between what happens to you and what you do with it is this gap where you get to choose your response. And if I could go back and change how I responded to what Sandy Nichols said, you bet, guys, I'd love to do that, but I can't. The past is gone. And I have to live with that failure, but it inspires me to be a much better version of me today than I was back then. It inspires me to be a better version of me today than I was yesterday. It inspires me to, to have a greater impact, I think, with what I want to do with my life now, which is speaking to people, which is inspiring them and helping people become entrepreneurs and take the step into controlling their destiny. Because I think if I'd stuck with the other thing, I might have become an actor who was stuck doing what other people wanted me to do all the time. You got to have a beard this length, your hair's got to be this long, pulling my puppet strings all over the place. And frankly, although I regret the ruined relationships, I don't necessarily regret the loss because I am on the right path. Why? Because I freaking choose it to be. I choose this path. And tomorrow I get up and I choose it again. And tomorrow I get up and I choose it again. And tomorrow I get up and I choose it again and again and again. And I reinforced that behavior. And I told you one of the one key tools that I used to do that I was going to share with you today. And one of those key tools, my friends, is to journal. I know, cliche, but journal, please journal. It's an opportunity for you to talk to you. It's an opportunity for the outside world to get quiet and the inside world to get loud. It's an opportunity for you to use your pen and to write down the stuff that's happening inside your mind to start to get some clarity, to reinforce that sense of purpose. The things that I have discovered, pardon me, the ideas that I have had while I journal, the openness between me and the universe while I journal is an amazing one. Some days I'm great at it. Some days I stink at it, but it doesn't matter. I show up to the page every single day and I start to write. And because I do that, I know I have that point of contact with me. The world is a loud place. It's a very loud place, right guys? And frankly, our ears and our mouth are far closer to our mind than our heart is. So if we want to hear what our heart's got to say, we got to shut all these other things up. Some people do it through meditation. I think that's very powerful too. As I said, most of the people that I know that meditate, they also journal. Because when they get those great ideas, they want to have somewhere close by to get that stuff down because it's gold, right? So that's one of my secret weapons. That's one of the things that's allowed me to advance my career. It's one of the reasons why I own multiple companies, several brands. It's one of the reasons why I am a success. And I'm a success because I have time, flexibility, and freedom to do what I want. And I did. That's, that's happened because I have combined those things. I have said, I will not react. I will respond. Some days, I don't get that right. But I know that's what I want to accomplish. So I practice what Viktor Frankl talks about, that gap. And recognize the fact that I am both sculptor and clay. That I'm carving out the best version of me. And you can do the same thing. Your hammer and your chisel are your journaling processes, your meditation processes. And you get more and more defined as to what you want, the clearer and clearer the statue becomes. And I'll wrap it up with this great quote from Michelangelo. Michelangelo said, inside the marble, David was already there. David was already there. 
That beautiful angel was already there. Michelangelo said, all I had to do was keep carving until I revealed him. And some days that's positive energy. Some days that's light. Some days that's beautiful affirmations. And some days it's anger, right, Matthew? Some days it's fire. Some days you got to chip stuff off. Some days you got to grind away. Some days you got to hammer on things to get those chunks off. But you are building a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. So as the great Sandy Nichols said to me, my friend, you are talented, you are brilliant, and you are wonderful at what you do and who you are. In other words, you have a responsibility to your talent. Thanks so much, guys. Are you still kicking around or did I fall asleep? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Michael, that was incredible, man. Like you, you spoke so many things like that awoke so many feelings and thoughts. And I, I just, everything from that Michelangelo quote, the, the Sir Isaac Newton quote, just that we are the hammer, or sorry, we are the chisel, we are the sculptor and the clay. That's so profound and so powerful. And the, I love that you brought up the, the man's search for meaning. I'm actually going to pull up a, pull up there that he up is. here. That quote from the, everything can be taken away from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedom, choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Oh, baby. It's so powerful. Like it's, it's so powerful. It's just like how powerful our choice is and how both sides of that, when we stand, when we diminish that choice, when we avoid responsibility from that choice, but the other side, when we actually stand in every moment saying, I have this choice right now, despite my feelings, despite my fears, my, my thoughts, I choose this is like, yeah. it's so profound and so powerful. And, and what you were saying about journaling, it's so, it's like, what well, that opens up for me, it's, it's clarity. It's like the more clear we are with uh, separate of the mental fog, the mental chatter, the mental chaos, the more we can reveal the masterpiece that we already are. It's, it's just profound. Thank you for sharing. That was just so beautiful. Everything, everything you said, you're such a, it was, I, I was just taken aback by everything you shared. So thank you so much, Michael, for sharing. That was beautiful. Oh, my pleasure, Abram. I, um, I have a, a few things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have so many things I want to kind of talk about because everything you said kind of woke up so many thoughts and for me. Uh, but for like, you know, just, just to start, you know, because you said it earlier, it's like Sir Isaac Newton, you know, how we stand on the shoulders of the giants before us. Like, that's, that's so powerful. Like, Sir Isaac Newton being one of those giants. Yeah. Victor Frankl being one of those giants. And like, yes. who, who inspired, I mean, I assume like, those quotes they are some giants for you but who are the people that who are the giants that you stand on oh i mean there's so many profound thinkers i mean uh, to be totally honest one of the guys that i am just in love with these days is tom bilyeu i don't know if you guys know him or not uh he uh so tom bilyeu has a youtube show called impact mm -hmm. theory but he built a company called quest nutrition right ah, matthew's got him yeah so I, I think Tom's yeah, quest yeah, yeah. and what he's doing, right? Because what essentially what Tom wants to do is he's an old and, – and one of the reasons I love him is I'm an old gamer. Like old school D&D, &D, RPGs, tabletop games. Like that was who I was as a high school kid. And so was Tom, right? And he wanted to go into the film industry and I wanted to go into the film industry. So there's some synchronicities there. But he's also a big-time comic book geek. And what he wants to do is he wants to challenge Disney – as far as its influence on children, but challenge Disney with really beautiful fables of like man's search for meaning, not this story, obviously, but a fable that illustrates the concept. And he's deeply committed to understanding the nature of, of our physical space and our mind and how those two things are interconnected. And yet the mind is not defined. It's not our brain because that's an organ, right? What is the mind? We don't, we don't know. Right? We technically, we don't know. We have no image for what that means. And so he's on a, he's really on a quest to help children 
right? To challenge Disney on their influence of kids and to influence them in a far better way, in a far, in a, in a way that has nowhere near the amount of cliche, um, like, uh, stories that they tell and all these ridiculous archetypes and stuff like that. He really wants to challenge those things. So Tom Billio is one of my, one of the guys that I, I am in adoration of these days and watch all sorts of stuff that he does. And he gets, he, in, he interviews amazing people, like just incredible people. Uh, Les Brown. Les Brown is a huge influence in my life. I get to, I get the opportunity to work with him directly right now. So that's really awesome. Uh, speaking with him and for him on different stages these days. So Les Brown's been a huge influence in my life. Um, I mean, Tony Robbins is amazing. So these are some of the giants per se, but I also am a very big fan of, <laughs> it's going to sound a little strange, but Bill Belichick and his ability to build a culture and a system of greatness for the New England Patriots. And you can love him or hate him. I totally get that part because he's not a very lovable character, but I respect his ability to build a culture that gets a result. As a business owner myself, right? I totally get that and building able to build a culture where people, hey, they want to be here. They want, they love to be in the businesses that I own. They want to be here and they want to grow with those companies. So that's that's another person, another giant, as you say, Abram, that I want to leap from the shoulders of. Powerful. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I had one other, well, I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm curious. In your experience of, you know, going, you know, going through university and, you know, looking back at your, you know, the failures and the successes that you've, that you've, I guess, just transmuted, you know, the transmuted your, your, your struggles, your, your things that you failed in into the very thing that you've created now as success. And what, at what point did that switch for you? Great question. Um, well, as a lot of actors do, I got really comfortable carrying a tray <laughs> for a living. And so I uh, I had the opportunity to, to jump into business ownership in a restaurant, which did not go very well. And uh, it, the business became a crucible for me where the wins and losses became obvious. You know, the, the ones and zeros, the binary of did this succeed or did it not succeed? suddenly became really distinct and obvious because you have a balance sheet, right? And whether you're succeeding on the balance sheet or not is just clear and obvious. So, you know, did a marketing program work? Well, did it work, right? So uh, I started to really understand, I guess, the version of who I wanted to be in in that specific application, Abram. Like I was I was going, okay, I, I know I want to achieve these things in my life. I have some some idea but how do I barometer that? How do I measure that? How do I possibly start to go? This is, I'm on the right track. I'm, you know what? I'm staying on the pathway that I want to be on. And I found those answers in business. I found those answers in the idea that, that building a great company that, that has the impact you're looking for is, is a part of the metric that you can use to measure your, your achievement level or not. And so that was when I st first started to turn that around right? And I didn't know what the hell I was doing until about five years ago, to be honest. I stumbled around as many people do in entrepreneurship for the first, I don't know, eight or so years that I was in business ownership. And it was a mess. It was a total mess uh, of relentless hard work and lots of, lots of garbage in, garbage out. But I was really, uh, about five years ago, I started to understand this whole idea of put things in place that are measurable, that you're on your way to achieving what you want. And that's how I started to turn that around. And I was cursed and blessed with always being really good at things that I did. I don't know. You probably know some of those people, like almost everything that I wanted to do, I was good at. I wanted to be a really good hockey goalie. I was a really good hockey goalie. I wanted to be a great actor. I was a really great actor. I wanted to be good at, I, I wanted to play football. I, I was a phenomenal cornerback. Wasn't very big. So I was good at playing corner and hitting receivers in the belt. Right. So there was all sorts of things that I was good at whenever I wanted to be them. And it was a curse and a blessing. It was great. But I was also never in a situation, or at least not often a situation, where I stayed very long at something that was hard for me. And so it was a pretty big realization that I'd screwed up my acting career 
with a lot of the initial stuff that I wanted to do because of my attitude and my ego. And I had to, I had to let it go. I had to forgive myself. Right. And part of that I think was just coming up with this new version of my life. This is where I want to go. I want to use the stage still. I just want to use it differently than I was before. And so that was part of the healing process was taking what I'd learned and redefining its purpose. That's a beautiful way of putting that. Um, and it's that, that constant mental reframing that seems to allow people to actually create a relationship or create a, um, a fulfilling and useful relationship with pain and suffering. Yeah. We got to have a relationship with pain, Matthew. You can't go through life trying to avoid pain. That's yeah. foolish. Yeah, well, it's impossible. <laughs> well, that too, but show me someone who's avoided their like pain their entire life. And, and I, yeah, I don't know what I'll do. I, I, <laughs> you know, Tony Robbins has this thing. I don't know if you guys have heard this before, but every morning he gets into either a nearly freezing cold shower. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like 28 degrees or 32 degrees or something like that. Celsius. like, it's super cold. Right. And, uh, or he gets into this frozen river when in his, where he lives in the mountains and every day it hurts, Matthew. Every day, every day he does it, it is painful. Every day it is awful. Every day he does not want to do it. But what he basically says is that I won't let my body, my instincts of preservation control my mind. I will not let it. And I assert my authority over my own behavior first thing. And that's great if that's what your soul is truly here to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's like to me that's the key. Like it, it, it's one thing to step into suffering knowingly because that's where I feel drawn to be. It's quite another to do it just to do it. Um, and like to me that's the difference. Like that's the difference between letting the mind decide or letting ego decide, mm. and letting that thing that is bigger than me decide. Right. Um. Actually, I, I wonder if we could switch gears for a minute because there was something you said while you were talking that I'd really love to go back to about regret. And actually, first, what what is regret to you? Like, what is that feeling of regret? And what is like what is it that causes regret in your experience? I think it's the loss of the what if. For me, I, it's like when I became a dad, you guys, I became acutely aware of the passing of time in a way that I was not aware of before. So a big part of regret for me, I think, Matthew, is the idea that that chapter's closed, that day is closed, that minute is over. I can't take it back. I said something that hurt that person or I said something I didn't even mean because I lashed out right? Or I made a decision that did not go the way I wanted to and grossly affected somebody else. Or I didn't take a jump of faith into something when I really could have. I don't get those moments back. And it it's, it's makes me, this is going to sound really weird, but it makes me really profoundly aware of, of the, the frailty of life. And I think to the point, like, for example, I, uh, I was just with my, you know, my wife works nights on the weekends cause she works in a really swanky, cool restaurant. And so it was a couple weeks ago and, uh, my son and I were hanging out at home and I got sucked into the, uh, that Sherlock Holmes show elementary, I think it's called on Amazon prime. I got sucked into this show. And I must have watched four or five straight episodes that night, ordered pizza, we hung out, and my son watched uh, basically kids' YouTube for several hours. Not my proudest dad moment. And I look on that Saturday night with a level of regret. And I know that's a simple one. I know that's an easy one, but I could have played games with him. I could have, we could have built puzzles together. We could have drawn some cool pictures for mom. We could have done things, 
but I chose not to. And so regret for me these days, at least, has this profound connection to a loss of opportunity or time. So taking that back to that idea of constantly reframing um, and finding the positive, I would add one thing to that, and that is regret is also a pointer to a lesson I haven't learned yet. Sure. So like, and I love the, the dad examples. That, that, like it's beautifully simple, right? Like, um, instead of spending time with the son, with your son, you spent time, you know, watching elementary. What, like, what was the process that led you to that moment of choosing TV over your son? And can you catch it before it happens Ooh. next time? Yeah. So I, one of my mentors, he talked about this idea called SOSA. So to be self-observant and be self-aware. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. For the first couple of years we were working together, it made total sense to me. But then I realized there was a missing part to it. So for me, whenever I teach the concept, I teach so, sa, say. Self-observant, so you can be self-aware, so you can, what you just referenced, Matthew, self-evolve. Exactly. Right? There's no, to me, yeah. he was missing the finality of that equation. What's the point of being observant and aware if you don't want to use that to evolve your behavior? Like, what's, what's the point, right? It's just, it could be, pure self-flagellation at that point, right? Like you're just beating yourself up over something you didn't do. But you know, like a lot of, a lot of addicts have this problem, right? Like they get into this, this, this tough circumstance where they're upset with themselves for what they did, but they haven't found the key to evolving their behavior to alter it at the point where they make the decision to go do it again. Right? Like they talk to a lot of, they talk to a lot of sex addicts and that's, there's a point where they make a choice to call that person again right? To make that bad gamble again. And there's all sorts of circumstances leading up there that they could turn the ship around. They're very observant of their behavior. They're super aware of what they're about to do. And yet they don't evolve the behavior. So um, to answer your question, I, yeah, I have to interrupt that. So for me, it's like, but it's not, it's not cold turkey either. Is it not watching five episodes? It's watching one. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's just a TV show, right? So for me, it's not like, and gosh, he enjoyed his, you know, 60 minutes of Blippy or whatever he was watching, right? So he had fun, but it was like, you know, there is a point there where it's like, okay, I've watched the show. You've watched the show. Now we're going to draw. Now we're going to do a puzzle, right? So I think there's a way of honoring what I possibly needed in that moment, which was some downtime and just some off time and also being super present with my son, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like that, the being present to me is the key. It's like every moment checking in with myself and going, okay, is this actually appropriate right now? Yeah. Like, is this, is this what my heart desires? Is this what I'm really longing for in this moment? Or when you say I every, every moment though, Matt, I, I feel my instinct is like, that's a lot of response. Like that's daunting to think about it every moment. That's a I very mental way of thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. I find that there's, I think there's stages in every part of our day where we transition, right? Like we're in this episode for an hour. And once that hour's over, we'll transition into the next thing we're doing with our day. I think it's those transition moments where you snap into presence. You know, it's like that re react respond moment, right? Like Victor Frankl was, or I was talking with Victor Frankl in, we're in this moment right now. But once it's over, we get to choose, like, am I going to go, you know, crack a few beers and sit there or like, what's, what's my next stage of my Tuesday? Some of us have it dictated to us already. Some we've already made plans, but there's a transition moment in there. And I think that's where people can really snap to, okay, that little mental check-in. I, I kind of feel like it's at some point, and this was like a gradual dawning I realized every moment is a transition point. Hmm. Like it, it's not just, yeah, like those moments happen. Absolutely. I recognize them all the time, but it's every single moment, like every single moment, you, the, the entire universe can be destroyed and then recreated 
destroy something new can happen every single right. moment. And the more I cultivate that awareness, that presence of letting that thing that is bigger than me speak act be the less overwhelming it all is. Right? You know, that comment you made about it, this is a, it, it seems like how you say, it was almost overwhelming like to, to think of it in every single moment. Well, yeah, it is to the mind. Mm -hmm. It's very overwhelming. Fortunately, you're not your mind. Yes. Right. Yeah, I like the, I, I've always loved this, this imagery and I think this will work for you, Matt. The idea that this is a toolkit. Yeah. yeah. Right? We have a soul and it's got a purpose. It wants to do things. And this is a set of tools, man. And and as you just said, right? Like that if we're going to use the tools to be in constant analysis, it can feel very overwhelming. But if you just spiritually sit in being present, I think there's a peace and a tranquility to that that is – universal and indefinite. I don't think it's easy to achieve all the time steadily for, and some people will never achieve it, to be honest. They may strive their whole lives looking for it, mm -hmm. which is sort of sad to say, but that's their quest, right? So I think it's, I, I think it's something that, that a lot of people strive to. And it's, man, is it a challenge in today's day and age with social media and the phones buzzing like great? Like it is, the tools are constantly being buzzed and, and, initialized right so many distractions absolutely yeah right so it's it's so it's definitely you know in this day and age there's so many external forces that i mean for me it just like it distracts me from what i'm up to you know i'll be in motion about something i'm committed to it inspires me and moves me and then i'll i'll be sucked in by something left field and social media or this or that, this email I didn't respond to or this correspondence yeah. is just like so fast paced. So it's like, it's, it is a dance. And like, I like, this is a toolkit and a lot of our lives, like including me, me I've been run by the toolkit as opposed to back to Victor yeah. choosing here's, here are my tools. Here's what I say is what's happening. Here's, here's my commitment in my word. And here's what, here's, here's what I create today right now. Uh, I want to, before we end, I want to ask you, Michael, what, what is your one day today? And, and what I mean by that is, you know, one day is a way of being, a right now way of being. It is mm -hmm. a community journey. It is not a someday maybe, but not now. And what, what is your one day today? My one day today. Hmm. Man, I'm caught up with something you you had said there before, and I'm <laughs> trying to shove it to the back of my brain and answer your question. Yeah, Yo, you can say that too. We, we could make it. Well, because you were you were talking about the toolkit and everything else, right? I think because in the end we're at a bit of a a crossroads because the toolkit's its its purpose is to keep us alive, which is why there's this aversion to pain, which we were talking about before, right? Like like the toolkit's job is to stay alive. That's it. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that till alive and procreate. Like it's a primal toolkit that we're working with. Right. Right? And and yet the soul has a higher purpose. The soul, like with the soul's put into the toolkit, the toolkit wants to stay alive and it can overwhelm the sensory functions of the toolkit with that purpose. Right? Just stay alive. Keep going. This is comfortable. This is a comfortable job. These are easy answers, right? Like the, the toolkit's designed for that purpose. It's not designed to, on a primal level, to push us past the limits of what where we want to go. That's not what it's wired for. So you got to fight your own wiring to achieve greatness. Like that's just what you have to do. Rewiring, yeah. And you got to get comfortable. Well, but even then, Abram, it's like you talk to my, like you see interviews with Michael Phelps, and and it was a challenge to go from ninety nine point nine percent to a hundred percent, like. There's always that push, right? Like you rewire, but then you realize that you've rewired and there's still a challenge, mm. right? So the re it's never finished, I guess, is what I'm getting at, right? Now, my one day, man, 
So my my big profound goal is to shake this crazy stat, you guys, that about only about 2% of those alive today will achieve what they actually want. Mm-hmm. And the biggest reason is they just never define it, to be honest. They never actually really with crystal clear clarity say, this is what I want my life to be. This is what I want my legacy to be. This is what I want my life to be about. I'm not talking about rich or famous or any of that garbage. I'm just saying that most people, they're defined by what they don't want, never defined by what they do want. Mm. And so my big objective in life is is to use stages like this beautiful one that you've given me the opportunity to speak on. And my one day would be to, to – do this all day long, you know, to have my son with me and my wife with me and to have the opportunity to share that destination all day long Mm. and to see the eureka moments ripple across other people of them going, "Ah, I finally that missing piece, right? I know what I don't want. I know what I don't want, but I've never pulled the veil off that thing that I do want. Mm. It's still murky. It's still got the shroud on it. I never took it out of the box. I don't know what's in there. I know that these 9,987 other boxes weren't the ones I wanted, but that one, that's the one I want, but I don't know what's in there. Right. It's, right. it's so you, they can't achieve it so right. that's to fix. Wow. Thank you so much, Michael, for being here. We got to, we got to call this a uh, close here, but I just, you're just such an inspiring individual. Everything I really honor and acknowledge just who you're being in the world and what you're up to. And just, just you're such a, a reputable force of love and of light and just awareness. And it's, it's just inspiring. So thank you for sharing with us. Oh, really thanks, buddy. My, my pleasure. would love to have you come back again soon. Uh, yeah. Really appreciate it, brother. And to our, to our audience, I want to just uh, say, please, this is your, this is your chance. We want to invite you to share on this stage. This is your space to share your unique gift, your unique genius. That's why we have this stage. It's, it's really for you, for what, for what you're up to, what, what you've been through, what you've experienced. When you share your story, we all connect and we see and we recognize ourselves. And that's what this space is for. I really appreciate you all tuning in. Thank you again, Michael, for sharing with us your beautiful story. And we'll be back on Thursday. I love you all. Be well, be safe, and we'll see you on Thursday. And until then, like always, one day is today.